can start at one. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. All righty. So let me do my little introduction. Um, you should be able to see and hear me. Rich, can you hear me? Rich is still trying to get in. Uh, well, anyway, good afternoon and welcome to the first installment of the Basics of Artifact Preservation with Gary McGowan. Gary is the president and principal conservator of cultural and um, preservation and restoration in New Jersey. He holds a master's of museum studies with a concentration in conservation from the State University of New York. And he has over 30 years experience conserving a wide variety of materials that include decorative and fine arts, archaeological and ethnographic materials and historic monuments. The webinar is hosted by, or today's webinar rather, is hosted by the Warren County Department of Land Preservation and the Division of Cultural and Heritage Affairs at Chippen Manor. My name is Gina and I am the Assistant Administrator of Cultural and Heritage Affairs as well as the Director of Shippen Manor in Oxford. So I think we've got our introductions down. Um, when Rich comes in and Will, they can do theirs towards the end. Um, during Gary's presentation, if everybody, including myself, will keep our um, mics muted and you see where the icon is um, so that we cut back on feedback and background noises because it can get very difficult to hear when there's a lot going, a lot of noises. And here we have ambulances and fire trucks and trucks and all sorts of noise around here. So I'm going to keep it muted. Um, following Gary's presentation, he'll have a Q&A so that you can um, talk to him about the artifacts that you have or any questions that you have, and he will do the best he can to answer them. So anyway, thank you for attending today's webinar. We will be scheduling a second one in December and, and I'll send out emails regarding that in a few weeks. So Gary. Thank you, you very much, it. Gina. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Um, so when Gina asked me to uh, prepare this talk, I started to think about the firms or the, the uh, historic sites that you might be associated with and um, I hope to tailor the talk towards those types of um, scenarios that you may be working with. I believe everyone is either connected to a historic structure, a historic house, um, or um, holdings within the county or community at large. So um, those types of entities uh, have your own group of concerns and issues to overcome in collections care. I know uh, you're very aware of this already, but it, it uh, is worth discussing again from the standpoint of conservation. So today I tried to develop this around collections care of proper handling, storage, and exhibition of objects. And because your institutions are so varied and your collections are so variable, um, not everything is going to pertain to each and every one of you. Um, for example, if you were all a uh, museum uh, based on exhibiting baseball cards, well, that would be a pretty easy thing to discuss. We would all talk about baseball cards and how the public can interact with those collections. But because it varies from historic sites in the 19th century and the 18th century, um, and some are house museums and collections vary, it becomes a very, very complicated um, approach to, to conservation. So if I could get the very first slide after, yeah, number two, thanks. So as I say, um, most of you have historic structures. Now that may be your primary exhibition space, that historic structure. Um, they all come with their own issues of environmental controls, heat, uh, humidity, light levels. And I'm going under the assumption that most of your institutions have not been completely retrofit for environmental controls. Most institutions do not have the luxury of installing large HVAC systems to handle humidity in the air, and therefore you have to constantly adjust and be proactive with your collections 
and your care of those materials. So um, we're going to try to discuss some mitigation efforts uh, to handle and care for those types of collections within your historic structures. Um, at the end, if someone wants to discuss their particular scenario for their, their institution with the environment and how it might relate to their overall collection, we can certainly discuss that or how it may pertain to one particular item. So um, the, the, the first thing I think we'll move into is the next slide, which is really collection storage. Um, I believe everyone will have a collection that has to be stored when it's not on exhibition. So these storage facilities can take a wide range of spaces. Some are in attics, some are in basements, some are on the ground floor. And I would urge you to really look at your collection storage facility. Um, many institutions that I'm asked to come in and evaluate, they bring me down to their basement where there's overhead plumbing pipes and they have their collections stored beneath them. Many institutions, uh, small historic houses, small structures, will have their collections stored against exterior walls. Uh, many of these historic homes or structures don't have proper insulation on the exterior of these buildings. So you then have, pardon me one second, let me just, I thought I turned my ringer off. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. So, again, many of the uh, the structures don't have adequate um, insulation to their structures, or perhaps their collections are not stored in optimal conditions. So, um, the other uh, scenario is sometimes I know the county has collections stored off-site. So how are those materials being stored differently than say the ones that are in the historic home or the main property? Oh, was that a question or? Are you asking for me? I can't, I don't know. For some reason my screen disappeared. If they if they click on to speak. All right. If if you need to speak, unmute your mic and then we can hear you. Did they lose us somehow? Now I lost you too, Gina. I think your your mic's off. I'm here. I for some reason lost my ability to see everybody, and I don't know why. <laughs> We're still here at Rutherford Hall. We can. Oh, okay. Did you have a question? I didn't know you were. We were actually, we were, one of us had to leave, so we were concerned with her leaving, and I wasn't sure if you had asked a question or not. Did, I mean, did you want to ask something right now? We could. No, right now we're good, and we're following you, and uh, I've got the, the slide is um, good. Oops, now we just lost the slide. Uh, there, there we go. There we go. Um, well, environmental condition, I mean, there's nothing we can do. I don't know, do you, Rutherford Hall's a 120 year old um, building that was a private residence. Right. So um, we, you know, the, the offsite storage, uh, not really an issue, the uh, in situ storage, I, I felt better because we do not have anything underneath water pipes and things like that. And so far as our collection is concerned, nothing's on an interior wall. I, the majority of our collection is actual has actually come from donations from the family. Um, oh, great. 
which we're very, very fortunate because this is an extraordinarily interesting family that nobody knows anything about. Um, as a matter of fact, the bulk of our collection was, it's on loan to us and it was because one of the family members was downsizing and in his garage for God knows how many years in very large Tupperware containers were just um, mounds of things that no one had ever gone through. And they said, have at it, have fun. And when we first started going through them, and this is in 2012, we found things, you know, or original letters from Teddy Roosevelt. Um, oh, wow. Uh, all kinds of um, in invitation to FDR's inaugural. Um, uh, a lot of what we've got is paper, but we do have some other things. Uh, but uh, it's really, uh, we're very, very fortunate in that the, the family didn't throw a whole lot out. So insofar as what we've done for storage is everything is currently in acid-free boxes uh, in a very dark closet. And when I, we need to, di to display anything or for creating a display, um, simply go in and everything is, um, you know, we're very, very, very low tech here. Everything is in a notebook. Um, and everything has been cataloged and there and have catalog numbers, uh, that type of thing. But, um, but as I said, I do feel better that we're, we're not, we're at least in a dark closet in acid free boxes, uh, wrapped in acid free paper. Great. Great. Which is probably better than it was cared for, for the first 70 or 80 or a hundred years of its existence. Right. Right. Um, well, that's very good. I mean, that's, that's terrific. Um, not everyone can say that they have materials in archival boxes and acid free boxes. So I think that's, that's a very good, very, very good first step. Um, keeping things away from exterior walls where, um, changes in temperature and humidity, um, can happen the most, uh, keeping them out of the light is a very um, a great first step, keeping them stored in that closet. Um, I think even with those safeguards already in place, there's probably things in the future that you might want to do um, when it comes to uh, more pieces coming into your collection. So if you have a system that seems to be working well for you, with the two-dimensional pieces that are um, flat and can be boxed, um, or if pieces are framed, now that suddenly you have framed pieces along with it. But if you suddenly get three-dimensional objects that are on loan or uh, donated to your institution, then that changes your scenario for storage and handling. So I think that, you know, what what you said so far sounds like a very great good approach i think you can just sort of add on to that as a um next step um certainly when it comes to archival materials um acid free tissue works very well but if you have materials that have leather components like books that have leather bindings you don't want to use acid-free paper on those types of materials. You want to use just regular uh, tissue paper unbuffered. You don't want the buffering against leather hide because that will actually, the, the buffering uh, tissues actually deteriorate the leather. So there are things I'm sure as, as your institution continues to develop and grow and more collections come into you that your storage and your um, archiving of the materials may increase. Great. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Um, so I guess now I have a different slide. I was going to, oh, there we go. Okay. So again, um, you know, as, as monies or grants or, um, donations come in, 
the other thing that can be purchased along with uh, open shelving are actually archival storage units. Um, this is something that they're quite dear and expensive, but a very, very good way of storing flat two-dimensional work. They're typical, typically metal um, storage uh, containers that have shelves. Um, there is a resistance to fire and a resistance to water damage. They're uh, electrostatically painted. So that's something that you may think of eventually investing in where then you wouldn't necessarily have to utilize uh, a closet situation, but you could actually, depending on the size, if your collection grows, go to something like these um, drawer archival shelving units. Um, it's, it's something that you might look into in the future. Um, paintings and framed art tends to be much better um, hanging and hanging with airflow around the back and front of the piece to prevent any type of biological growth. So if in the future, if you don't currently have framed or hanging um, artwork like an oil painting or a pastel or a watercolor, it is um, preferable to hang them with enough airflow around the back and sides of the pieces. So um, things like hanging clips or uh, wire racks so that uh, pieces can be hung on are a preferable manage, uh, way to manage your collection. Did you have another quick question? No? So maybe I'll go on to- uh, Thanks, that alone has been helpful. Oh, okay, okay. Um, when I talk about um, resources, you may be familiar with some of the resources, but uh, other companies you might not be. And if, it, if you're looking for um, uh, storage cabinets, storage systems, um, some of the companies that I've provided their names and contact information, you might want to look and it might be a wish list uh, situation where, you know, you can always increase the type of storage in the future one at a time, either it's these cabinets or maybe a, a floating system for paintings, things like that. So uh, I think it would be, you know, interesting for you to take a look at some of those those uh, companies. So if we move on to um, maybe exhibition uh, for the collection exhibition, that's the next, that's this uh, slide. It seems a bit small, but it, that, that doesn't matter. You don't need to see the, the picture. Um, so this is critical, I think, with collections care and, and kind of passive conservation where we as stewards of the materials have to deal with multiple issues. Um, I just show you this type of photograph of an image of a museum space where you have multiple forms of objects within a collection. So you have some that are in exhibit cases, but you have large furniture that has to be exhibited uh, outside of a case and is open to the public and uh, open to the experience of the public interacting with it. So I, I think, again, being mindful of these types of scenarios of how one exhibits one's collections, uh, how much interaction the public uh, can have or should have. Uh, certainly casework is a wonderful addition to any institution, um, but can be very, very expensive. And some individual uh, entities may not be able to afford uh, plexiglass uh, vitrines or casework uh, or have things behind plexi. Um, but when possible, that is an, a, a good valid way of approaching exhibitions to protect the, the materials, 
both for things like temperature, humidity, and light level, where you can create a micro environment for something as it is exhibited. So if you have something that is very reactive and sometimes historic uh, documents, uh, paper products, materials like that, are very, very susceptible to fading or reacting poorly to temperature and humidity where they might start to cockle or um, any kind of biological activity. So sometimes framing and vitrines or plexi coverings is an appropriate means of preserving that object. As I said, though, not everyone has the luxury of buying those types of materials. So one has to um, evaluate the need of the object or needs of the collection uh, and how one can best exhibit it. Um, certainly furniture may be too large to uh, protect behind plexi, but then in that picture it shows there's a stanchion poles and a cord to protect the, art, the object from the public. But again, one has to uh, remember temperature and humidity as people enter into that space. And your institutions may do uh, reenactments. They might have the public come to an event where there is a lot of activity in a gallery space within your institution or a museum space that will um, actually cause degradation or reactivity, let's say, with the objects within that room. So these are all things to just sort of be mindful of is the different objects. And as again, you have collections that can vary. One object may be very stable in a regular ambient room temperature of 70 degrees Fahrenheit and maybe a humidity level of 50 degrees. As soon as we get a day like today where temperatures are low, but humidity is very, very high, you might start to see reactivity on those types of objects. And then if you couple that with a, a reenactment going on or a public program, those changes may be very, very drastic and the object may react negatively. So again, it's it, with collections care of that is to sort of project the different scenario scenarios going forward on how an object is going to react, not just in its space or in its environment, how it's going to be utilized in that environment, but how it's going to interact with other objects. For example, I had a client recently who had very beautiful um, early 20th century uh, celluloid combs, which is an early form of plastic. Well, inherent to the actual comb and the early plastics, it outgasses nitric acid. And that's just something that occurs as part of the normal degradation of the object. So as time goes on, more and more nitric acid is released from the object. And then therefore, objects that may be sitting in close proximity or, or in the same case as this object started to show um, different forms of decomposition. Corrosion formed on metal, other objects may start to change in color, and it's due to the fact that there was this inherent vice within the object. So again, when you have varying collections, if it's all one thing, if it's if it's turn of the century notes and paper, well, then you have far less chance of reactivity between groups of objects. But if you say you had a uh, uh, some Revolutionary War document, and then you had lead uh, ammunition or bullets sitting in the same case, well, as the lead goes through its normal decomposition through time it may affect the two-dimensional paper products. So again, it as caring for the collections, it's a very, very complicated um, uh, group of, of chemistry and of physical or physicality of the object. So again, 
how they are exhibited and what can be done to mitigate those situations or stabilize the, the situation, um, that can be brought forth through conservation. So there are things to do, uh, for example, with that uh, series of beautiful combs that I were, was talking about. In that situation, we just used materials that would absorb the nitric acid within the display cabinet or the display case. So these pieces were actually framed and we used techniques to absorb the acids and therefore they pose no more threat to themselves and to the other objects within the case. So these are things I think that are, are critical to be mindful of is not just how the object reacts to itself or to its its aging properties, but how it reacts to the uh, other objects or and or the environment um, handling and and some institutions will have a study collection. So interpreters may be uh, within the museum and they might pass an object around or school groups might come in and interact with the collection. How is that interaction carried out? Um, do they get to touch the objects? Um, do they see them behind plexiglass? Do they see them um, mounted in a framing system? Those are, are critical things to think of every time one puts something out for exhibition. Uh, light levels, how much exposure to ultraviolet light in a exhibit. Um, things that are relatively inexpensive is you can cover the exterior windows if you're in a historic structure or a house. You can cover the windows with um, UV film, which still allows you to look in and out of that window, um, but blocks the ultraviolet light into the space. So if you have an exhibit space or something that you're concerned about fading, uh, you can put those films on the window, which will lower or prevent fading that way. Also, uh, switching from incandescent light bulbs, which produce ultraviolet light, to new uh, LED lights, which don't produce the same ultraviolet uh, range in light and therefore won't cause as much fading. So there are many things to do to mitigate situations while things are on exhibit. Also, um, critical things of housekeeping. Um, how does one go through the uh, exhibit space or the gallery space and deal with cleaning? Is it done by volunteers? Is it done by one person? Uh, what are the concerns uh, for the collection on how one dusts and cleans? Uh, this was something that we're, I'm talking about now in exhibits, but could certainly be related back to storage. If things are not in archival boxes and not stored on shelves, how are they maintained in the storage facility uh, for things like dusting and uh, removal of debris that might settle? Um, also, for both collections on exhibit and in storage, uh, a good pest management uh, protocol should be in place. Pest management for paper products, uh, paper objects or paper-based materials is critical. Uh, you can get things like um, uh, insects that will burrow into or consume paper. Um, if humidity levels are up too high in storage facilities or exhibition uh, areas, it can bring pests into that environment. Um, you can get silverfish, you can get other pests that might want to uh, both use the object as a food source, but also in many instances to lay eggs, to continue that life cycle. Uh, textiles, two-dimensional paper products, paper objects um, are particularly susceptible to different insects. So things like a 
um, protocol for pest management would be another area where I would recommend um, doing things like um, uh, glue traps or pheromone traps in exhibit areas or in storage areas to make sure that you detect or eradicate any type of insect that might be coming into your space. And this is true again for larger pests. Um, some offsite storage facilities may also have um, rodents or other things other than than insects. I've, I've sort of seen it all uh, over the years. So pest, ma uh, pest management along with housekeeping is a critical area, I think, to um, to review and to designate a team that knows how to properly clean or dust uh, an object either on in storage or on exhibition. Um, if people are going to have uh, volunteers carry out some of those tasks, um, then I think training is always critical to have those people properly trained on how to handle how to um, work with an object, when it is appropriate to have gloves, when it is not really necessary to have gloves, um, even protocols for things like having food. I know we all like an occasional snack here and there or a cup of coffee, but how we have uh, those types of food sources in either exhibit spaces or in storage to try to prevent that. And then there are the odd situations like the combs that I discussed where they're outgassing materials that are very uh, dangerous if, if not properly handled. So if there is something like an acid being re uh, released, then gloves would be an es essential way of handling those objects. Uh, if there's a lot of acids being um, produced, you wouldn't want to be eating or drinking a cup of coffee around that because in the air there'll be small particles of acids that are caught up in the humidity and then you'd be ingesting those. Um, this was uh, a another example I will give you. There was a client that I had um, in New York City with a fabulous toy collection that is uh, on exhibit and unfortunately uh, the type of exhibit materials, meaning um, information plaques and other dioramas that were put into the space were actually causing the lead toys to literally disintegrate. Uh, large pieces were, were coming off of the toys, the paint was, was being lost and the surface was sloughing away. So it wasn't even what the institution was doing with their collection. It was unfortunately a third party vendor that did not utilize completely archival materials for printing up signage or printing up um, information re regarding the exhibit. And that was actually causing the deterioration to the, to the collection. So sometimes it's, it's not even something that's within your control necessarily, it might be an outside force coming in and dealing with their collection um, negatively. So I guess if we kind of move on to another area that I really think is critical and you may already have this in place, uh, but it's worth discussing nowadays when we have so many uh, storms, we have uh, hurricanes. Um, I went through several different uh, hurricane disasters uh, through my career with Hurricane uh, Sandy in New Jersey most recently, but many of the other ones in New Orleans. Um, and and so I, I know firsthand um, disaster preparedness and disaster recovery. So um, if you do not have a current disaster recovery plan, uh, I think this is an area that is very, very critical for small institutions. 
And this disaster plan really needs to cover things like if we have a fire, who's first called? Who comes and helps out? Do I have a staff of volunteers? Do I have someone who is trained in disaster recovery? Do I have companies that can come in and deal with the disaster? Most recently, <clears throat> I, I, I think you may have heard on the news, there was a um, cultural center in Chinatown in New York City. They had a terrible fire. Most of their collections were two-dimensional, again, uh, mostly paper-based objects, um, prints and drawings and, and paper of all sorts. The fire was quite uh, devastating, <clears throat> but along with the fire came the water that was used to put out the fire, which in many cases can become just as damaging to the collection as the fire was originally. Excuse me a minute. So a very good, intense uh, disaster preparedness plan is a critical approach for a small institution. As I said, um, there is a risk of flood, of fire, wind damage. Uh, again, a, a scenario, if we, we have a, a, a wind event coming through and part of the roof is torn off of one of your institutions, um, how best to mobilize a team to get in there and protect the collection. Um, in case of fires, um, it might be a situation where the fire marshal will not actually allow your staff even into the building because it is no longer structurally sound. So in those types of situations, it's critical to, um, and they'll all do this for you if you haven't done it already, the fire marshal will come from your particular municipality, they will come and meet with you and you can discuss where collections are stored, what your collections are like, um, and how best to mitigate any type of disaster. So say your collections are stored on the first floor in a say closet uh, and they're in, in cardboard uh, acid-free archival boxes. Well, those types of boxes, they burn quickly. Um, so do we focus on when the firefighters are in there, they try to make a effort to get towards your storage of collections and maybe not worry about starting in an area that is uh, less critical. Uh, obviously, they have to make those decisions if there's structural supports and things are collapsing and whatnot. But all of these things need to be taken into consideration on how to best get in and salvage your collections. The same way with flooding. Uh, if collections are within your facility and flooding uh, can occur, it doesn't sound like some of you have issues of being uh, at a lower level with your storage or your exhibit spaces. But for those institutions that utilize lower level areas that may uh, have flooding, this is another critical area of how do we deal with that. Um, <clears throat> again, for another um, uh, example, um, I have a client, an ongoing uh, collection where they were damaged by Hurricane Sandy. Um, their collections were stored in an area that was not supposed to flood for 500 years, that no one had any knowledge of flooding in that area, and everyone was guaranteed that this was a fantastic place for storage. Well, Sandy hit and 22,000 objects were underwater. So it can strike and it can hit anyone um, so again, um, who can um, uh, best uh, come and help with that recovery? If again, it's a, a friends group or a, a volunteer group, if it's the staff, what access can they get to? Some people during Sandy 
were no longer able to get out of their homes and get to say the historic structure. So what can be done uh, in that scenario ahead of time? What can be bordered, boarded up? What can be raised to a higher level if it's flood area? Um, what can be done should all be put into your disaster recovery plan. And um, as a resource, uh, on the other side of this slide is something that was produced by FEMA. And if um, we can't look at it now, when we go, when I go live, I'll hold mine up. I have one in the office. Oh, there it is. There it is. Um, this was produced. I think you can still get them. You can just write off or contact FEMA. And what's nice about this is it's a, just a little cheat sheet. Um, at the top, you can sort of see that there's some things that say furniture or textile. And you turn the wheel and then it sort of gives you uh, little guidelines on what you can do in that particular situation for that group of objects. So there's lots of information out there. FEMA is definitely a wonderful resource to get these um, types of materials for collection care uh, during a disaster. So um, that's probably um, most of what I would have to say for that, that uh, disaster recovery, except to say that even after that disaster, there's also uh, law, law enforcement issues, access, uh, you don't want uh, to have the fire put out and then you can't get back in because the fire marshal has, has deemed the structure unsafe, yet looters might come in. The, the collections like that have been lost where people have gone in after the fact and uh, stolen objects. Um, that might not be a scenario that you would encounter, but th that is something that has occurred to other institutions um, that I've had firsthand experience with where um, the disaster was basically over and mitigated, but they could not, their staff could not get back in and pieces were lost. Um, again, even with the disaster recovery and mitigation, uh, many times things can get damaged after the fact. Um, for instance, mold grows within 48 hours of a water incident. So if a collection gets wet due to a sprinkler system or even a spill, I mean, it doesn't have to be a major disaster. You can have just, I don't know, frankly, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I did a work there and, and uh, uh, somebody put a wine glass down on an Egyptian piece and some of the wine got spilled. So, I mean, it can be a small thing that needs to be mitigated. Um, so, 48 hours after a water event, meaning something gets splashed or gets saturated, mold can grow. Mold spores are in the air. We're never going to be able to get rid of all of it. If you have a very good HVAC system with uh, air handlers to prevent uh, spores traveling around, um, that is possible, but most institutions, even the major museums, don't have widespread um, uh, air handlers that are going to basically be of a medical grade. So keeping that in mind, mold spores are everywhere. We're inhaling them as, as I'm speaking, I'm inhaling them, I'm exhaling them, they're everywhere. But within 48 hours of that water event, mold can grow on an object. So I, I bring this point up in disaster recovery because if you can get to your collections before the 48 hours, and get them into either something to stabilize them or treat them or start to dry them back out, um, you don't run the risk of mold growth. The problem with Hurricane Sandy is objects in museums sat there for days and days and days before they could get 
access to them and mold started to grow. And it doesn't just grow on two dimensional objects. Um, I had to treat a great deal of furniture where mold had started to grow and cause damage to some of the historic surfaces. Some of the early varnishes and shellacs and whatnot were affected negatively by the growth of the biological activity, which mold and sometimes can actually include fungus. Fungus can also grow within that 20, uh, that 48 hours. Um, so again, with disaster recovery and preparedness, that's something to be concerned about is accessing what's there. Uh, there are workshops, uh, there are protocols on disaster recovery to learn how to deal with uh, documents, photographs, uh, objects. Um, I've uh, put on a few disaster recovery um, workshops in the past. I've participated in several. Um, it's something to think about for staff members. Um, sometimes they also do uh, workshops through your fire department uh, to show uh, you've probably seen this on um, television where they show how rapidly, say, a Christmas tree can burst into flames and then suddenly the room is engulfed. So uh, fire departments do have a lot of information on how quickly things can combust, how um, things that you can do to prevent those types of scenarios. Um, Something I, I didn't mention before when I talked about uh, storage, but sometimes collections are stored in boxes that are plastic. Um, and there's nothing wrong with uh, Rubbermaid or Tupperware containers. Uh, they work quite well. Um, sometimes people use archival boxes called chloroplast, which is a looks like a corrugated cardboard but is actually made out of a polyethylene um, plastic. They're wonderful for storage of materials when you are concerned about moisture um, in a situation in a, in a storage or you know in, in your collections. The problem with all of those plastics is they're terrible during a fire event. So what I say is if the risk in your disaster uh, preparedness plan, your risk of fire outweighs your risk of flood, it's much better to keep your collection stored in archival cardboard boxes. If for those institutions that have a much higher rate of flood damage, like the one that I talked about for Sandy, I'm really, I encourage those uh, institutions to start putting things in the plastic storage boxes or storage bins because they fare much better in a wet uh, flood scenario where the box itself does not deteriorate. So I guess that's that's sort of it for disaster recovery, I think. Um, maybe you go to the next slide. Um, and this is something if uh, at the end of, of the slides, if anyone wants me to discuss these uh, firms a little bit more. Uh, please don't hesitate to ask the question. But again, this this is just a short list of companies that provide conservation materials uh, and archival materials for storage and ex exhibition that I think that if you're not aware of all of them, you might want to just send for a free catalog from some of these places. Um, and um, I think that that uh, not all uh, companies are equal in the sense that some uh, sell products that are really quite wonderful, but quite dear, very expensive. And if you have limited budgets for archival materials, it's best to shop around. Um, on the top of the list there is Uline which is not a company for uh, archival materials per se, but they sell ethafoam in a variety of thicknesses, which is that picture to your left, which is that big white block, that's ethafoam. 
Um, and they sell it much, much cheaper, probably uh, at least half the price than if you went to say Gaylord Archival, which is a wonderful company and they sell great products and they're easy to work with. You can just call up a Gaylord and say you want, you know, uh, a five foot piece of ethafoam and they'll be happy to ship it out to you. But if you do a little bit more detective work and a little legwork on uh, a company like Uline, you'll find the exact same product, just far cheaper. So I think that the, the takeaway here with the list of companies is you just have to do uh, comparative shopping before you, you purchase. Um, Small Corp there, uh, you may or may not be familiar with Small Corp, but they are a wonderful independent company that provides frames and vitrines and exhibit cases and furniture. Um, they can custom make uh, beautiful framing systems for artwork. Um, and again, you'd be able to find a very similar product in maybe Gaylord but small corp will be that much cheaper. So it's, it's good to do a little comparative shopping. Um, exhibit mounts, you can pay for a mount maker to come in and do beautiful mounts, or you can buy custom ready-made uh, exhibit mounts from Art Display Essentials. They're right here. Well, I'm in Belvedere right now, but uh, I live in Blairstown. And, uh, they're right in Blairstown. Um, they have a mail order uh, catalog and they sell exhibit blocks, which would lift an object up off the ground. They sell mounts for things like hats for clothing. If you're exhibiting um, a hat or a dress or what have you. So that's just another great resource for exhibit materials to properly uh, cradle and support the object. So all of these materials, Benchmark is another wonderful company that provides uh, archival uh, materials to be used in contact with the object. Uh, if you're going to be displaying an artifact, uh, a button, uh, a cannonball, what have you, and your you want something between the actual object and the surface that it's sitting upon, which is always a very important thing to have a barrier between whatever it's sitting on. Uh, Benchmark sells a variety of um, archival fabrics like felt. Some of them are sticky backed and you can use those to create um, a barrier between the object and the, what's referred to as the decking. Um, all of their materials have been tested uh, through a process called ODI testing, which evaluates their materials for their stability. So their interaction with um, materials like the object. Uh, Gaylord has also done extensive uh, ODI testing, which is done to determine if their materials are going to pose any problem with uh, the object or any of the materials that they're providing for you for storage. Uh, I know firsthand with Gaylord and uh, Art uh, Display Essentials and Benchmark because I was the one that performed the uh, tests on them. So I can verify and uh, uh, give a stamp of approval of those companies because their materials do meet all the museum standards. Um, not all archival boxes are created equal. Uh, you can get true acid-free boxes, but you can also get buffered uh, archival boxes. And sometimes companies do sell boxes under the guise of being archival acid-free, but really what they are are buffered boxes, which means they add calcium carbonate into the actual cardboard during manufacture. What happens through time is that that calcium carbonate is is used up and the box is no longer acid free. 
So again, um, it depends on the company and really doing some due diligence on what type of, of cardboard and, and how it was uh, produced. Uh, if you find a box and it's described as lignin free, that is true acid free box. They've removed the ligneous portion of the wood. That actually is the part in a tree that forms the acids. If you don't have a lignin free archival box, it may not be 100% archival. Um, it depends. Hollinger Metal Edge is a very good, reputable brand. And as I said, so is Gaylord and some of the other sellers of, of uh, boxes. Sometimes if you see online, um, and you can find on, on Uline several different boxes. And there again, you just have to be very uh, cautious. Because again, they're not all created equal. And sometimes they'll tell you, oh, yes, we have an acid-free box and they're very inexpensive you know they might be two dollars a box and you say oh great i'm going to buy 50 archival boxes because they're so cheap well they're really not archival and they're really not fully acid free they're just buffered so sometimes buyer beware you really have to do your due diligence with those um but there are many many other companies um, and other resources for materials. If you're interested after this, this webinar, uh, I could certainly talk about more product companies. Um, but things like Ethafoam are really wonderful. They can be cut with something like a mat knife or uh, just uh, like almost a paring knife, something very easy and you can cradle an object. Because what I see uh, for two-dimensional objects, most of the time storage is lacking through the institution. I see that there's not enough support under an object. Um, and in the case of exhibits, that's when sometimes an exhibit mount is really required. I just looked at an object down in Middlesex County a week ago and it's on exhibit and it's a wonderful piece but the exhibit mount is just wanton and and is not supporting the object so things are are rotating and twisting because the adhesive is not properly supported so things like ethafoam for storage can be really a critical vital addition to your um archival materials, nesting. If things are nested in boxes, you can also wad up tissue and make bolsters to the edge of boxes. Keep in mind too that depending on handling, if something's in a box, how does staff handle that box? How do they pull it out? Are there instructions enough on the exterior so that handling is kept to a minimum? Do people know what's in the box or do you have to go through collections to find things. Uh, all these little tips can help to prevent overhandling or jostling of an object. If things need to be kept, obviously, in a certain plane, if it's better, you have, a, say, a Native American ceramic piece and it needs to be maintained horizontally. Um, you want to make sure that that information is conveyed, that if that box is moved, that you don't want it to be put into a vertical position. Uh, I've seen all of these things. I've, I've seen historic societies because they have limited space, put a framed piece in and then put it vertical and it should never be vertical. It should always be stored horizontally. So all those little things um, can be taken in consideration with um, how to use these products how to support the object. Stockinette is another really wonderful thing that can be filled with sand or with um, sometimes metal shot and used to make these sort of snakes or coils to uh, help prevent things from moving on shelves in storage or uh, if they're being examined or looked at. Um, you also might which is something I should have mentioned a little earlier, but 
if you are getting new collections in, you might want to have an area that is set up to examine the object as it's inventoried or assessed into your collection. That way it's separated from the rest of your materials for a period of time. Um, you might use things like the stockinette uh, to create the, uh, a snake tube that supports and cradles under the object. Um, these things to have like a, a clean room or a clean space to isolate an object can be critical. I've seen far too many times an object gets uh, donated and accessioned into a collection, only bringing things like moths with it um, and or other pests and now suddenly it's in the entire collection. So things like archival materials or supports and structures can be used to isolate an object um, before you introduce it to the rest of your collections. Um, I think um, maybe the next slide um, is just some uh, resources along the line of those resources for materials. Well, these are just a few institutions that you can contact or Google for information. Uh, American Institute for Conservation is the firm or the entity, not a firm, but an entity that I belong to. Um, they've been around for close to 50 years now. And um, they are a clearinghouse for uh, information on conservation. They also do uh, workshops, uh, public outreach, um, and they are also are a governing body of conservators uh, that if you go through their review committees, uh, for instance, for myself, I've attained a um, professional associate within this, this uh, entity, and you go through a peer review. So not all conservation is, is equal, and um, you may already be aware of this, but there is a very large difference between conservation and restoration. If you have a restorer come in, they may or may not be trained to understand the chemistry, the decomposition of an object or the stability or instability of that object. That restorer also may utilize materials that do not age appropriately or do not age well uh, or cause interactions between it and the object being treated. Um, uh, opposite to that is conservation relies on methods and materials that are well vetted. So a conservator understands the chemistry and the physics and the, um, the agents of deterioration of an object along with the materials that have been tested, uh, like I had mentioned with um, uh, Gaylord, if I use something like their ethafoam block to uh, cradle an object which gives it passive conservation technique of support, I know that that product has been well vetted and I understand that it is an appropriate museum material where um, someone else might just, oh well, we'll just wrap it in newspaper, it'll be fine. So. Um, the American Institute for Conservation has all of that information at its disposal for you. And as I say, it also, it does not um, uh, provide a uh, list of names that are licensed. It is not a licensing board, but it does do a peer review uh, for those that are on their referral list. So if you wanted to say, get a conservator that works on Model T Ford cars and is known to have skills in that area, you could go on to the American Institute for Conservation 
and go to the page where it says, find me a conservator. You could type that in, find a conservator in a 50 mile radius that works on large material, large equipment, large vehicles. So there's listings for textiles, for paper, for, for books, for whatever you would have issue with. Uh, it's a great resource. Uh, American Alliance for Museums, it's a lot of information for museum practices, for uh, loan agreements, for um, information to uh, do archival work, um, uh, registrarial works, registrarial forms, um, uh, database systems that are recommended. Uh, there's a uh, uh, past, uh, past perfect is one that has been recommended as a database for museums. So as institutions move from maybe paper archives up to computer archives, um, the uh, Alliance for Museums can provide some guidance. Um, Alliance for Response is a disaster recovery group based in New York City, which has ties back to the American Institute for Conservation. Um, they again provide workshops, uh, outreach for to the public, uh, to public and private entities, museums and uh, historical societies and what have you. Um, they also uh, can mount uh, professionals to come during a disaster and help to recover your materials. Uh, Alliance for Response New York most recently uh, carried out all the disaster recovery for that small museum down in Chinatown. So again, it's something to have resources with. Um, also allied um, uh, entities, which I don't have here for resources like um, uh, rapid response for freezing or freezer companies uh, during a disaster where things have become wet. If you can prevent mold growth in that first 48 hours, freezing is an option. I myself and my own company have uh, the ability to do freeze drying. So clients that I've had in the past have had books, uh, other manuscripts or vellum, uh, paper products, what have you, um, that have been damaged by water. We did uh, freeze drying to remove the water and stabilize the object. Um, again, um, if mold is there, uh, some companies um, with rapid freezing can provide assistance uh, for things like mold and or pest abatement moth infestations, bug infestations. Rapid freezing is a very, very effective technique for dealing with pest infestations, which does not rely on utilizing um, any kind of insecticide, which you would never want to use directly on your object. And in many cases, you don't want the public or the uh, museum professional to be touching or handling something that has been sprayed with a pesticide. So companies that provide rapid freezing um, can do a lot for pest eradication. Um, so that was just a few things uh, for resources. As I say, if anyone has any more questions about that or more about the AIC, I'll be more than happy to, uh, to open it up to a, a regular discussion at this point. If you guys have questions, that's it for my slides. <clears throat> okay, Gary, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, recently, we had uh, some damage done to our wall because of weather. And while it was being deconstructed, um, a bunch of, uh, I don't know if you guys can see this, China pieces oh, wow. were oh, found nice. in the ground at grade level. Let me pull it in closer for you. So it's blue and I haven't cleaned it yet because I wanted to ask you what I would do or how I would use, what would I reuse to uh, 
fix this. Let me show you some. I have two cups. I, I labeled them. I have them identified where we found them. I have not measured them yet, but on some of the pieces, I know it's hard to tell here. There might be some blue edging. Oh, okay. On, yeah. on it, and it matches some of the pottery that they had found, not pottery, some of the um, china pieces or ceramics that they had found about 10, 20 years ago when we had a compromise to the soil on the hillside. <clears throat> I tend to think it was probably where they took their broken stuff and threw it out. Yeah, like a... So it's probably somebody's garbage or the garbage of one of the family members that lived here. So right. it's encased in, in dirt and mud and grime. I'm not exactly sure how I would clean it to preserve it or if I should bother to preserve it since we have so many pieces located here. Um, that was the only exciting thing that came out, <laughs> but still anything is, is exciting. And it was at grade level. It was not below. They didn't dig for it. It just happened to be there Okay. when they took the wall out. So I have varying size pieces from a few inches. Oops, let me pull this back a little bit to smaller shards, half this size. And the pieces look like they've been broken for a while. Right, Prior I, to see being put I see in. the edge. And you yeah. can see this edge is really thin and really, really weak. Right. right. So I, I right now I'm storing them because we're under Shippo. Uh-huh, right. In cups, in a box, labeled, dated, with location, just so I have a record of it for now. Right. So the, how would I go about cleaning those? So the black-ish looking spots and all... Does that appear to be like a burning episode? So do you think this was like a trash midden that you just have bits and pieces of? So does that black look burned or just like organic staining? <laughs> it looks to me like it's dirt. Okay. You know, just dirt and mud. Um, I don't gotcha. see anything else. Uh, again, it was near our exterior boundary wall. And... Uh, you know, it was in the dirt popping out. So it, it looks like dirt. It doesn't look like concrete or mortar or anything along those lines. So that, what you see that is dark is actually dirt. Ah, okay. Okay, gotcha. All right. So this one's a real pretty straightforward one. Um, you can just get a little basin and with a very soft... Um, uh, toothbrush and or if you have like a bamboo skewer or a chopstick sometimes um, you can then it would be preferable if you used wash water that was uh, either distilled water if you went and just bought a, a gallon or two from the drugstore and then you can soak the ceramics which will loosen up the the uh the dirt and with a little bit of gentle exfoliation with the toothbrush if it's a very soft toothbrush and or if something's sort of stuck on there you can just ease it off a little bit with the bamboo skewer or the chopstick um if if it's something because it, this is sort of archaeological sort of found at ground level um there is always the risk of salts being in the body of the ceramic. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, repeated soaking in distilled water might be advisable. So once the dirt is off, you might want to just do a couple of, of rinse baths. You know, you put them in, you let them soak overnight, then you take them out and you drain off the water and you put a, another rinse bath in. And you sort of wash them over a period of, of maybe a couple days, a week, you know, and just change the water maybe twice or three times. Um, if you were set up for archaeological processing, there's a, a, an object, a, a, a meter called a uh, conductivity meter, okay. which you may be familiar with. They're like $250, though. And that measures dissolved salts in water so if you were processing them archaeologically and you felt 
that there might be salts, you would put them in the wash water and then you would use that conductivity meter to measure the salts as they leach out of the ceramic and enter the water. Mm -hmm. And so as that number goes up on your con conductivity meter, you know that you're leaching salts out of your object into the wash water. And you would just do that until the wash water no longer shows uh, an increase in reactivity in that, in that uh, with the conductivity meter. But in lieu of that, short of that, I would just wa water wash them, remove the dirt, because you don't want to store them in storage with any kind of dirt or organic material affixed to them because that's going to potentially cause damage to other materials and including the ceramics. So I would water wash them. I doubt very much if you need any detergent or surfactant into the wash water, you should be able to get 90% of it off just giving it a, a good bath. Um, you can, I think I've mentioned to you in the past that there is something called Orvis. You can just get it at Tractor Supply. That is a very, very mild uh, soap. It's actually used on farm, uh, on livestock. Uh, a tiny, minute amount, just like the end of your chopstick um, into a basin of wash water just so that you start to break the water tension of the, the water, it'll clean easier and better. You really don't even need that, but if you did wanna just add a drop or two of the Orvis in, um, I think when you were visiting my, my studio, a jar that you get at Tractor Supply will last you your lifetime because you need a drop or two and it comes in a, I think a, a I don't know if that's one gallon container, so it's a lot, but but it's very mild and it works on a whole host of things. It's great on using it for textiles if they need to be washed. It's good on, you know, most things The Orvis works really quite well. And it doesn't have a lot of detergents that we would get at the grocery store or the hardware store contain all kinds of things like scents and oils and, and other materials that you don't want to impart to an object. And the Orvis is, uh, does not have all of these scents and other uh, oils and products in it. And then if you are using the Orvis, then I would just continue to rinse a few times to make sure that you get all the residue out. And then it's most important to let them air dry, but to get them elevated, even if you put them on like a, a rack that you would have for baking, um, you know, uh, brownies or something, just so that you get air underneath so okay. that they're not sitting flat and then just allow them to air dry. Okay. All right, thank you. Sure, no problem. Does anybody else have questions about an artifact or artifacts and how to preserve or clean them? And Rutherford Hall, here we are. I, first, I have a few questions about sure. everything you've said. Um, first of all, are we going to, uh, can you send us this um, PowerPoint, this presentation, so that, you know, so all of the information there I can refer to? Um, it will be put on the county YouTube. Okay. So okay. I can send you the link. Okay, that's perfect. Okay. Okay, that was question number one. Question number two, um, you mentioned that uh, actually Tupperware containers can be used for um, storage and that because, as you said, um, the um, acid-free boxes are very expensive. Uh, Gaylord is the, the company that I've been using to purchase all of our supplies and they're very expensive. But for example, um, we recently received um, um, one of the Rutherfords had a collection of liturgical vestments, oh. and, um, and I'm going. And they were they were they were in a wooden box in an old 18th century house, and no one. And I think wrapped in old newspaper. So I've been wrapping them in 
acid-free paper, but I'm running out of boxes. Can I put fabric into like plastic boxes? You sure can. You sure can. Um, <clears throat> um, I do like the, the Coroplast uh, boxes, which are not nearly as expensive as the um, acid-free boxes. They are by nature because they're plastic um, acid-free. Um, and they look just like your regular banker's box. It looks just like a regular um, archival box, but it's made out of a corrugated plastic. Um, if you, pardon? Could you, could you spell that? What was it's that? It's like cor, C O R. I think it's C O R A plus P L A S T. Oh, like, corrugated plastic makes sense. Yeah, like corrugated plastic. Yes, there you go. Oh, Put it together. Good for you. That's why we're both here. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can, if you find boxes that are made out of polyethylene, um, they are perfectly good for storing um, materials. Uh, if textiles are also great, if you now, if it's liturgical vestments, um, it's hard to roll on a tube, but you can for some uh, things like banners, flags, um, other text quilts, uh, coverlets, you can roll them on a acid free tube and then just cover that with polyethylene sheeting. Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely a acceptable method of, of uh, storage. And then you don't have to worry about boxing. The, the oh, thing, and, and, the, and the folds then. In correct. The yes. Wow. I was just going to say that. Yes. And then you don't have to worry <laughs> about the folds. Huh. And okay. So what kind of rolls was that? Just a. So you can buy the, the, there's a couple of ways of doing it. I always try to think of the way to do it on the cheap, but. Good, you, good, good. <laughs> you can buy a um, acid free tube of varying lengths they they all sell them um uh, you can i think even uh uh uline sells. i was just gonna say you i used to own an art gallery and i used uline for packaging and things like yeah. that and i just thought uline would probably have something like yeah that. so <laughs> you, you can use a uline archival tube and then roll the textile onto the tube and then if you feel like it's still going to move on the tube, uh, like try to, un you know, it's going to flop a little or unroll. Sometimes if I'm doing a large tapestry, um, just to hold it in place to give myself another pair of hands, I use twill tape, which is just unsewn uh, woven tape, you know, like a flat tape. There's no adhesive. There's no, it's just... Um, like what? if you were doing so sewing, like binding mm -hmm. tape, or if you're doing a hem or something. Right, like, right. Yeah. So twill, it's just that's the type, and it's a cotton twill tape that it's sold at uh, uh, Talas, T A L A S. That was on the list. Right. Um, right. It's sold at University Products. That pretty much everywhere sells twill tape. Okay. And you can you can just tie the textile onto the the tube and then you just can go to your hardware store um as long as it's polyethylene sheeting uh you can get it at home depot uh, lowe's uh and the local hardware store and you can wrap the textile the tube the whole thing like in a big rolled up uh right. with the polyethylene sheeting and then it can sit in storage and you don't huh. need to box anything or fold it. Oh, it uh, it's, it's wonderful. How about maps? We actually have this. It's this is a crazy place. People just walk in. Well, they used to <laughs> walk in. And some once I don't know how many months ago, a woman walked in and she said, "I have these old maps that I can know I don't really want to store anymore." And I mean, these are, were enormous. They were the original maps, one of them's from 1903 of the Rutherford Stuyvesant 6,000 acre estate. Uh, and the other one was a 1913 map of this estate. Um, and they were deteriorated, they were coming off, they were, you know, mounted on a wooden down. Uh, yep. 
and in both cases it had released the the map itself so i could you wrap these in the same type of polyethylene sheeting you could what i would say is if there is um the surface is uh damaged or some of the surface is is coming off i've yes. seen this with with uh large maps you can um you don't want to really tightly wrap the map no. so you could use a combination of directly on the surface of the map you could put either tissue like okay. acid-free tissue right um or glassine do you know glassine paper it's kind of shiny yeah 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 i have that so you could use glassine and that goes directly on the on the map and okay. then over top you can just buy um polyester batting right from like joann's or one of those companies that sells batting like yeah yeah for quilting yeah yeah and just cut a piece the size of the map and then lay that on so then when you roll it onto the the tube Right. It gives it gives that much more cushioning so <laughs> that that you're not pushing, you know, you're you're giving a little give. Yeah. Makes and perfect sense. Slap it the same way. Yeah, terrific. Okay, now my final um I brought down one of the things that was in those Tupperware, and I don't know if you're gonna be able to see it. This is uh, a nineteenth century uh, portrait. Oh yeah of um lewis morris rutherford i'm not going into the family lineage but i don't know if you can see there's stuff and i don't know if it's on if it's mold i don't know what it is if it's it's or if it's on the glass or if it's on the actual portrait it's can difficult to see but is it little orangey brown dots yes okay so what that is is um uh, due to humidity in those areas and the paper itself, the actual object has acids. So when the, it literally those spots are being burned because of the, the acids being released out of the paper. Out of the paper, okay. Yeah. So short of the only thing to do with that is to try to keep the humidity levels low on that if you ever wanted that treated if it's something that uh, you're going to exhibit and the flocking that that those dots look you know offensive for how you're going to exhibit it those can be removed and or lightened uh, by a paper conservator so you right. can get a paper conservator to, to bleach that out okay um they they will tell you it may not be a hundred percent but it would be lightened considerably um, okay and and they basically wash the the acids out of that paper okay but, but that's a treatment you would you would have to send it out to be right. tre treated for but okay. short of that that's due to inherent vice within the paper itself okay. and the acids that exist within the paper um and moisture causing that that burning um can you flip the piece uh so i can see the back yeah it's um see, we were just looking at it it's it's tiny tiny little nails that are holding the back of the frame and then there's this you know the stand uh, okay so uh so what i was be thinking is dollars to donuts there's no archival material between the artwork no. and and the frame no i'm so, sure this was framed i i'm figuring based on this is and this is the way i figure out things in because all of the photographs which are hundreds and hundreds of photographs the family's given me i kind of look at the people who i recognize in the photograph and figure out how old they might be. So by looking at that portrait of old Lewis Morris, I'm figuring that that was done in the 1860s and he was in his 50s. Uh-huh. So um, yeah. figure it's from about the 1860s. 
And actually we have larger images that another member of the family gave to us um, of this and his wife, of this same image. And I know these, the larger ones that are hanging on the wall um, were framed in England in 1892. So, gotcha. So, so the, figuring these are, oh. oh. That, that might be something then to really systematically approach from a conservation stabilization, you might want to deframe and access the back of, of the pieces and change out or put at least uh, a barrier between the artwork and the framing material. Great, okay. Um, I, I've, uh, not too many years ago, I worked on a beautiful silk embroidered piece and when I popped the back off, it had period newspaper that was oh, wow. left there, which was interesting because I got to read what was happening and you know, like See, eight, right. eighteen whatever. So See, that's I, that's the way I feel. What like the vestments that uh, we were that we received? They're wrapped in. Some of them are wrapped in newspapers from the 1930s, and so of course my first impulse is to, well, what's going on in New York City in the 1930s that I can read about here? The heck with the vestment. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I was gonna say, was, was there a Thomas Nast original um, image in, in the newspapers? Alas, yeah. there, was, there was not, but, but there was some interesting, you know, price of land at the time and things. Oh yeah. That. So, so it, it was interesting information. So again, I, you know, I don't, condone throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You can always um, archive any anything of any kind of information separately and in a box. Right. But I would actually go through some of your collection and take the backs off. There is a product called um, Marvel, like Marvelous, Marvel Seal. Um, if you bear with me a moment, I will grab a piece. Just go, don't go away. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> it's pouring here. I'm not going outside. Oh, remember, <laughs> I put them upstairs and didn't find them. Six yeah. <laughs> well, I thought it was actually very easy to find, but unfortunately, <laughs> it must be in a, in a different closet that downstairs that I have to find. Okay. Anyway, what it is, is it's silver colored and it is mylar and it comes in rolls. And Marvel Seal is used to create a, a barrier between whatever the object is and the surrounding. So sometimes people, um, they're out on Long Island, there was a museum of Native American materials and they were utilizing furniture to store some of their collections. And we decided to line the drawers with Marvel Seal, um, which oh. get, gave a protective barrier against the oak furniture and the object. So most recently uh, uh, down in Philly at MAR, it's the Museum of the American Revolution, pieces that are on loan there when I took off the backing of the historic framed object, this was a pastel, um, or not a pastel, a watercolor. Um, there was, there was not, it, it was acid board. There was no archival materials whatsoever. So I didn't want, and, and it also had a wooden uh, back plate. So the frame itself had a wooden board that I didn't want to remove because that's historically how the thing was framed. So I used a piece of marble seal. Did you say marble? Marble. marble like. I like marvelous. Oh, okay. Like, yeah, like marvelous. Okay. And I put that between the backing board and the artwork. So and you could do the exact same thing 
with that little piece you showed me. Sure. You could just cut a an oval, an oval and right. lay it against the the back the of the piece the back and of the then board. close up the frame. Right. So right. that will go uh, a great deal to, to prevent you interactions between non-archival materials. If it's historic, if, if it's something that, you know, it's just cut out of an old box, well, what is that? You know, that's really nothing right. critical. Throw that away and put in a new piece of archival board. Right. So it really depends, but but right. yeah, I would systematically try to upgrade the backs of, of all the pieces to prevent yeah. that acid reaction. All right, great. Yeah. So those are my questions. Thank you very much. Oh, you're quite welcome. I, I think the next time Gina and I had talked about maybe um, targeting, going in more in depth to a particular uh, class of objects. Um, so I don't know if you want to reach out to me or reach out to Gina, if, if it's something that you'd like to come and participate again, uh, if there's something that you would want us to, you know, hone in on in more depth than just sort of a general overview of collections. It All sounds right. like most, most of what you have is paper and, and two dimensional, but I don't know, it might be furniture, or as you say, you just got vestments in. <laughs> right, right. It, most of what we do have is paper and photographs. But you never you? know. I was talking to a Rutherford, I got an email from a Rutherford yesterday, and um, <clears throat> he said to me, uh, I don't know how he ended up with a lot of stuff, but he's given up some extraordinary things. And uh, he said to me, oh, I've got more stuff. I'll, I'll be bringing it out in, in the spring. And it's like, well, okay, wonder what he's gonna show up with. <laughs> right, uh, right, right. Yeah, so you never know. Like I said, the, the, the Rutherfords, they kept everything, <laughs> which is a good thing. Yeah, it's like John I. Blair here in Blairstown. Yeah. Oh yeah. I think he had his very first gum wrapper. Oh, <laughs> they're not that bad. They're not that bad. Unfortunately, they saved the really good stuff. So, uh, oh, yeah. 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 So, with, with those vestments, are there metal threads? Or, yes. I, oh, okay. So, just FYI, that would be one thing to be aware of that usually the um, vestments have either a silver or yep. a gold wrap, yep. wrapped around and the core center is usually a silk thread. Yep. So the the vestments can tarnish really quickly and that silver um, can really uh, tarnish rapidly. And okay. then it's hard to, you can clean it, but it's, it's not so easy. So that would be something that you would want to, um, restrict the the type of exposure to sulfur in the air so that would be something that i would think about um closing up into maybe a more rigid uh or polyethylene wrapping something okay. so that that not just a standard box um, okay be, beca yeah. because of the the metal threads and the other thing that I did not, I, I neglected to mention in materials, and you're probably well aware of them, but um, there are uh, sachets of, or, or uh, little um, bags, bundles of uh, silica gel that you can put into some of your rigid boxes. Oh, okay. Yep. There is another um, material called art and it's like ART sorb, like you're absorbing art sorb. Okay. It's okay. in um, uh, University Products, which was on the list that I right. show, showed you. They right. sell it. What is different about art sorb to silica gel? Silica gel is a crystal and it can be placed directly around an object or in a little sachet, kind of a little bundle. Um, but it removes yeah. it removes moisture out of the air, so it only takes moisture out. So usually the manufacturer sells you um, silica gel that is called buffered to 
45 to 50 degree to 50 percent humidity mm -hmm. so it means that if there's more than 50 percent humidity it pulls out the rest into the silica gel and holds on to it so mm -hmm. you can use that in your storage boxes right. art sorb what's nice about art sorb is not only does it suck out the the extra humidity like the silica gel does but when it goes too low, the actual art sorb releases the excess bound humidity. So if you had something like, um, I don't know, a bone object, like something made of bone, and you wanted the humidity <laughs> to, well, like a toothbrush or, oh, okay. uh, yeah. you know, there's lots of, we yeah. use bone for buttons for you name it. So oh, yeah. if you wanted something like um, that to be maintained in a, in a humidity of 45 to 50, if it goes too low, the art sorb releases that extra humidity that it has within it. So your small controlled environment will actually, the humidity will ra raise up. So that's what's nice about art sorb is it kind of takes away but gives back when it's needed. Um, it's much more expensive than the silica gel, but it does more than the silica gel. The silica gel only works in one direction. It only pulls away the, uh, the humidity, but it's very good for things that like um, vestments that have the silver thread. You want to keep, you don't want high humidity around that because the the more humidity is going to bring more sulfur in the air more sulfur in the air is going to cause tarnish all right one final question sure. on the third floor there is a large walk-in cedar closet um can i use that for storage or no absolutely yeah okay absolutely okay. um I, you know, uh, textiles are good in a cedar closet. Uh, Two-dimensional paper things are good in cedar. Um, if there's a really high level of cedar oil still, which I, I would tend to doubt, but... After 100 years, yeah, I would too. I doubt it. But if there was a lot of cedar oil, you wouldn't want metal objects in That's there. That's quite fine. Okay. But, but for the most part, yeah, no, that should be fine. Okay, great. That's it. I'm done. Great. <laughs> this was easy. Yeah. So I don't know, Gina, I guess that's, I don't know if there's anything else or if you had any other questions. I have a lot of different types of artifacts here. I don't even know where to begin. I have paper. I have two-dimensional. I have photographs. I have cloth, clothing. <clears throat> furniture. That's going to take me a century to figure out how to to uh, preserve everything. But if I can start off with the most delicate pieces, which I did not bring down, which would be paper products not stored in, archi stored in archival boxes. We do have items in archival boxes, but the ones that didn't get into those prior to me being coming on staff um, are starting to turn into dust. And, and I don't want to lose anything else. So um, I'm probably going to have to get a, a list of things stabilize it because we don't have a humidity controlled environment much like rutherford hole this is old but it's much older than rutherford it's from the 1750s and onwards so we have stone and that brings in moisture and humidity so right, right. we both have the same issues rutherford and shippen in the manner of how do we store these items without having um a completely humidity controlled environment right. <clears throat> you know right. so yeah. And there's there's a lot of stuff here, but we also have things in storage, which is supposed to be humidity controlled, but I haven't had a chance to get over there because of COVID. So um, but that's not anything that I would worry about. It's mostly metals. We have firebacks over there. We have some old furniture, which, you know, is okay. And it was in okay condition when it was put in. But it's a matter of trying to figure out how to preserve everything here. We have paintings, and Gary knows this because we've talked about this. Paintings, we have china, we have furniture, we have textile, for, you know, cloth furniture. Uh, we have velvet, we have velour, we have hand-stitched, embroidered, 
We have books, some of our documents are 100 years old, and it's just... <laughs> yeah. Well, I, again, you know, the, the something that I, I don't know if I really mentioned enough, but when it comes to storage and even exhibits, um, if you can't really control your macro environment, if your space within the, the building or the historic home can't be controlled enough, you can always create micro environments. And that would be back to the silica gel or the art sorb or uh, covering uh, objects with polyethylene sheeting so that you're creating a better environment for the specific object where you can't really control the, the space itself. So, you know, those are things that mitigations can be done to, to deal with the object. And when you have a, such a varied collection, um, it's, it's daunting. So, the, I, you know, the best thing is to survey and kind of go forward again with, with collections that you can periodically go back and reassess so that you know, as part of your housekeeping that you kind of go back periodically to see how things are faring, if there's any punctuated deterioration, why, um, you know, if, if people can, not, not every institution can have um, H, the, the humidity, um, the, you can do like a hydrothermograph, um, those are meters Fisher Scientific sells them. Um, you can get them through Ga through Gaylord, but they measure temperature and humidity. Um, it's great to have one of those in your storage area so that you know what things are being stored at, so you know what the humidity is. And you can also use them in your exhibit space to see if uh, fluctuations occur. So you kind of get a sense of, of what's going on in the environment. Uh, you know, this time of year, we're going into winter where humidity is just going to plummet. Uh, we'll be down into the twenties. There are whole, um, classes of artifacts that really do not do well with very, very low humidity, um, furniture in particular, or things with inlay, uh, do very poorly when the humidity drops too low. Uh, old hide glues dry out, things get brittle, uh, legs and arms get wiggly and wobbly, and it's because the humidity has dropped so low. So um, it's more difficult in an exhibition space if it's like one large room and you have people coming in and out. It's difficult to control for the humidity, but in storage, it might be easy to create a micro environment or tent it over with some polyethylene sheeting just so that things don't dry out as much. It's good to try to, they're not very dear. They're, they're probably between 40 and $50 for one of these um, uh, meters from like Fisher Scientific to measure the humidity. So like yep. a, a thermograph is what they're called. So what about a thermograph, like a hydrothermograph, okay. they measure temperature and humidity. You can get them digitally for about 40, 50 bucks. You can buy the old timey one when I was in grad school that is the actually made with um, blonde hair. And I kid you not from <laughs> Swedish women, you'll pay like <laughs> You'll pay like $700 for that. It's actually <laughs> human hair that is strung in this meter. And as the hair responds, it, it makes the needle go up and down. So, uh, you know, that's, that's the expensive version. But you can find one digitally that works fairly well in the $50 range. But that way, at least you know a ballpark of what you're dealing with for temperature and humidity in your spaces. Great. I had another question going back. Sure. I was looking this up while you were there. <laughs> um, the cleaner, was it Orbit with a V or a B? Or this. Okay. Like the clothing. Yes. yes. Okay. Exactly. There we go. Yeah. And 
like I said, you can buy it through one of the conservation places and they will sell you eight ounces for 20 bucks for, I don't know, $11. You can go to tractor supply and get a gallon of it. You'll, you'll, You'll never, you'll never run out. So that's, that's sort of, I think one of my takeaways, I hope that, that you feel that there are many ways to reduce costs and right. still use appropriate products and not sort of be under the thumb of some of those those entities i mean they're all great don't get me wrong and i have great working re, uh, relationships with all of them but i myself i would rather spend 11 dollars for a gallon of service at tractor supply than eight ounces for 27 dollars right right clearly wonderful thank you yep Okay, so I'm really glad you, you were able to stay. We had some technical difficulties uh, with the other two participants. They could not get back on, and I think a lot of it has to do with this weather because it's just oh. glorious outside. But it is being recorded, so we are going to um, – well, let me stop recording it. Hold on. Ah! <laughs>